When speaking about the remains of ancient advanced civilization in Africa, everybody thinks about Egypt only. But there is much more than that. Let's visit a village in Ethiopia. It is called Yeha. The ancient ruins that are found over there show amazing uh, building quality. The sides of the stones or the geopolymer blocks are digitally perfectly even and smooth. They are polished. According to mainstream sources, these lands have been always inhabited by various very simple tribal cultures. And then how come we find these buildings of very high quality in what really looks like antique Greco-Roman style? The quality of this building work in this unknown village is much higher than that of the so-called supreme emperors of Rome, whose main palaces, supposedly the center of power, they are made of mud bricks. While this structure is made of big blocks, some of them reaching two and a half meters in length. Also, the building style of these megalithic structures, there are a few of them in Ethiopia, is very similar to these that are in Yemen. These photos are from Yemen, just for comparison. And by the way, it's absolutely the same in the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, in Cambodia, in Turkey, in Peru. It's almost as if the same builder made them all. But this builder is not at all present in the current history of Ethiopia. Why is that? Now look at this single stone. What was it? The 20 some meters long. That is a gigantic. It definitely rivals the highest quality work uh, found in the Egyptian megaliths. And this is the actual quarry from where the mainstream historians assure us that uh, this stone was taken. Well, it is a completely different color. It is reddish. Uh, look at the megaliths, they are uh, whitish and uh, dark, like uh, black. That's not there at all in the quarry. Actually, the entire so-called quarry consists of small staircases cut in the rock. Not to mention the enormous obelisks in Exum, the capital of Ethiopia. They are much bigger than the famous Egyptian obelisks, and even with our so-called advanced technology these days, we cannot rebuild them to their previous glory, not in one piece anyway, as they originally did. We had to do it in pieces. We couldn't do it all at once. And again, not only the weight of the obelisks, but also the technology that was used in cutting them is uh, far beyond uh, the reach of any primitive tools, no matter how many millions of slaves were laboring for hundreds and thousands of years. These achievements are simply ignored by those who write the mainstream history. They do not mention them, pretend that they do not exist, and continue writing only about mud huts. In the past, the historians, the cartographers, they were well aware that Ethiopia belonged to this culture that now we mistakenly call Greco-Roman here. In an old medieval map of Ethiopia, we see a king who to us may seem a wrong place, but if we believe what we see in terms of ruins instead of what the penguins tell us, then everything falls into place. Another interesting point to consider is that the megaliths of Ethiopia are made of stone that is not available locally. The nearest place where such stone can be found is Egypt. When a group of Russian researchers visited the nearby quarries where the mainstream historians tell us and assure us that the stone was taken from, they were surprised to find out that the stone over there has nothing to do with that stone that is used in the actual megalithic sites. So it's either artificially made stone 
which we call geopolymer, or it has been transported over thousands and thousands of kilometers from Egypt or somewhere else, which is of course not a problem for technologically advanced civilizations that can fly heavy cargoes anywhere in the world, but it's highly problematic for primitive tribes that supposedly lived in the territory of Ethiopia. Here we go. This is another interesting medieval map. Again, we see some sort of Caucasian ruler. The megaliths in the capital of Ethiopia, Exum, are also very, very interesting. It's a mixture of perfectly shaped megalithic blocks, hard stone, and the very primitive old stone work as well almost as if two teams were working side by side. And that could have very well been the case. Just see. They are mixed. It's not that the primitive was made on top of the better, older foundation. And this is a pretty good example here. It seems that the survivor builders were putting their megalithic polygonal blocks this is the same like Peru, but this is Ethiopia, but it looks like Peru, or Turkey, or Japan, absolutely the same. Look at this, same polygonal masonry, no gap between the stones, huge sized blocks, so these are the survivors, and then the rest, the rough, low quality work beside them, is the work of the simple tribal people that were building alongside them. Or at least that's one of the possible scenarios. Another possibility is that initially the full building was of high quality and it got destroyed later on. And then the tribal people tried to repair it themselves. Now, here, another parallel with the megaliths of Yemen. They basically look identical to those in Ethiopia. The building style, the blocks, the size, just the same. And we're back to Exum. The familiar megalithic underground tunnels, enormous blocks of very high quality work. Everything is so polished, even the sides that do not show. The sides that are facing other blocks, they are also polished to perfection. That is why there is no gap. There's no mortar between the stones. And, as usual, we see the survivor's style clamps as everywhere else in the world. Here, even the original metal has survived. The connection between the culture that I call the nature people, the survivors, and the ruins in Ethiopia is not confirmed just by the style, but also by the writing found on those ruins. Now we call them European runes and Slavic runes, but apparently they were not exclusive to that region, so again the name given by the mainstream historians is not really suitable. Here we are still in Ethiopia and we see a very familiar symbol. In the previous episodes we saw it on the headwear and other symbols of the Japanese samurais of Lord Shiva in India, on the flags of the native nations of South and North America. Of course, it is all over the flags of medieval kingdoms in Europe. They all belong to the same culture. That's why the building style is the same. And the symbols are the same everywhere. And by the way, the village where the megalithic ruins are found is called Tieha, probably for the same reason for which one of the Japanese islands was called Yesu. The famous rock-hewn churches of Lalibela, again Ethiopia. 
the elders still tell the story that in the past angels of other races used to join their religious processions and how were the churches made that's a lot of work by the way the people used to work during the day and at night the angels used to do the work and it seems that this group of angels wasn't that independent after all because it cut the symbols of the survivors again on the walls of the churches according to the locals the king during whose reign these churches were made used to travel in altered states of consciousness and in those realms he was in touch with the angels under whose guidance the churches were made the passages around them are quite deep and at places some 15 meters wide that's a large volume of stone very unlikely to have been cut by local tribes especially within the very short span of a couple of years during which the churches are considered to be built if we take the traditional story about the help of the angels then the full story is much more believable especially taking into account how fast they were allegedly built and as i found out very recently ethiopia is very very rich in rock cut ruins in absolutely the same style as we see them in turkey in italy in great concentration and also in dozens of other countries their distribution covers most of europe and asia and apparently now africa the same rock cut rectangulars which are typical for the early stages of rock cutting all this is in ethiopia only and then the derunkuyo style rock cut cities these cavities here are rooms and then we find even the last wave of rock cutting also in ethiopia these arches same like those of turkey armenia italy spain and as in all other regions rock cut ruins from the earlier periods were later on converted in monasteries and churches here same like in turkey you see only half of the room is left that is why they had to add patches otherwise the rooms would be useless the monks would roll down the cliff as they sleep for example so this is an example of rooms that have been patched while this here they did not get patched everywhere the same trick the mainstream historians pretend not to see that it is patched and persistently misrepresent the sites as being only christian again the patches are obvious here some of the rooms have been reduced to mere scars in the bedrock if the full thing was as recent as we are told then we are the remains of the rest of the structure even if the structure was destroyed suddenly then it wouldn't need such a long time to erode still there should be the remnants in some form but everything has been washed away or disappeared same like with this greek island massive rock cut ruins just look at the width and height of this street or channel or i don't know premises rooms deep underwater well underwater so what they do they call the rooms caves which is quite misleading because a cave is a natural formation 
these large basins, they just ignore them because these are beaches, so apparently you can ignore them. But in one of the better preserved rock cut rooms, somebody put some uh, Christian paraphernalia and now that is immediately recognized as historic site. This is Christian. This, this is allowed to exist in their history. And now back to Ethiopia, where not only we had the older so-called European runes, which are actually worldwide runes, but also later on, during the era of Christianity, people used writing very similar, if not identical, to what most people would call Cyrillic writing. Actually, believe it or not, but in the Middle Ages, Ethiopia was repeatedly referred to as the place of Saint John the Baptist. There could be two possible reasons for this. First of all, because Ethiopia was a Christian country. Yes, here are just two of the numerous medieval quotes which you can find in the works of Anatoly Fomenko. It describes Ethiopia as place of monasteries and bishops. It also specifies the dark-skinned monks outnumbered the white-skinned. So probably there weren't that few pale-skinned anyway. And the other reason for which Ethiopia was the place of St. John the Baptist could have been that, believe it or not, but in the Middle Ages, Ethiopia was to be found primarily in Europe, in Africa as well, but it was a European phenomenon. Yes, in the medieval books, the name Ethiopia was very often always uh, related to, let's say, Germany or Siberia, things like that. Now, what we now call Ethiopia was called Abyssinia, mainly, so to say. Of course, other names would be used, like here it is called India, nowadays Ethiopia. Okay, to make it more clear, even than that, here is your Ethiopian Ocean. Of course, thousands of kilometers away from any Ethiopia, and that map was not an exception. This was the norm here as well. Ethiopic Ocean, in modern language, the Southern Atlantic Ocean. So what is going on here? It is very important to understand what's going on. In the relatively recent past, they changed almost all geographical names. And that was done with the specific and very clear intention in mind to make old texts and old maps, which by chance have escaped parasitic destruction, unreadable and not understandable for the people who would come in future. So that's how they took care of the written history. Now let's see how did they take care of the actual historic sites. Let's visit the site located in the very capital of Ethiopia, Addis Abeba. Ironically, located just outside the city's main university, in the area which is currently devoted to trash disposal, the ruins of an impressive medieval so-called European-style fortress still stick out here and there from the trash. At places, the walls are preserved, even up to a height of about four meters. The remains of many towers are still seen, and the full fortress has a very regular pentagonal shape, something which is typical for the so-called European star forts. The place is neglected to such an extent that I couldn't even discover its name, just travelers talk about some ruins next to the University of Addis Abeba, where they must be teaching history, I guess, do they? That so-called history deals only with the illiterate Africans who lived in huts, 
and that is to prepare them for the next stage of the parasitic plants, where they don't even have huts anymore even. And because they know that there are still some normal people left who will realize that this is seriously wrong, for them they have a different story. You see? Kindly they are giving them a small check and in this way the good people have to become convinced that they have done everything possible. Which is yet another illusion from the parasitic paradigm, because what we should do actually if we want to put end to this nonsense and starvation is first of all abolish central banking and get back to an honest monetary system. And once the packs of banksters no longer can create unlimited free money for themselves, then they won't be able to buy off entire countries as they do in Africa now, and the earth will slowly recover from the dark ages of the banksterism, and people of different color will again live like before, along each other as equals. Excessive hoarding of money should be also declared illegal. These artificial gaps in the society between rich and poor are only artificially created in order to keep us in constant fear and to instigate hatred. We no longer need politicians who waste our time with small talks about reforms adjusting the conditions of slavery. We need politicians who will end up the slavery to the banksters. So the people of Africa, as the people of all continents, were regularly visited and helped by human and non-human angels. For example, the story of the tribe of the Dogons is somewhat different. Their angels came from Sirius, the star of Sirius. Some researchers found also confirmation to this legend that the people of the tribe tell in terms of um, advanced astronomy knowledge, which the Dogons could not have obtained in any reasonable way, keeping in mind their relatively primitive lifestyle. So, let me show you some images of the indigenous original inhabitants of Africa. No, there's no confusion with the images. It's them. It's the Berbers. On one side, the mainstream penguins don't deny that these are the original inhabitants of northern and even central Africa. And on the other hand, they assure us dark-skinned people live in Africa because they were fried under the sun for many thousands of years. And that is why they became black. So, how come some were getting fried and became black, and others were there in the same furnace conditions and remained rare and uncooked? The proper method for spotting and exposing liars has always been the same. As they continue to fabricate new and newer stories, the mountain peak of lies becomes so high that it's impossible anymore for all the stories to match. Actually, as you saw in the previous episode about Australia, I believe, the Berbers simply belong to that initial wave of survivors' culture, as we call it, the people who tattooed their faces. And it's no surprise that we aren't being told the truth about their origin in northern Africa because it was the same in Australia, in Peru, in China, in Siberia. Burials and mummies of Caucasian blonde people are found, but they never find time to include them in the official history. And the Berbers not only look Slavic, their writing is also very similar to the runes used in Europe. Now, the ancient African languages are basically part of this worldwide rune-like writing system. 
and the mainstream historians are so busy finding the differences between the different types of runes and giving them all completely different names, so that they look like a completely different writing system, they're so busy with that that they fail to make the main observation, which is that on all continents without exception, these writings are found. Not even one continent is without them. That they belong to a single culture. How is it that they are assuring us that everybody evolved independently and was discovered at some point by the colonialists? But they were all using the same writing before their so-called discovery. Why is that? So they are telling me this is an African language from Sudan, 1,000 years old. Then how come I don't know any African languages and I read here words written in modern Slavic, Mikhail, Cosmos. What a joke. No, this is not some local language from Central Africa. This was language used over continents. The patterns on the traditional Berber embroidery are identical to the patterns of the Slavic people. This is a historic Berber site. The traditional outfits of the Berbers are very similar, if not absolutely identical, with the, the traditional outfits of some Slavic nations. What you see now are photos of traditional Slavic outfits and if it is not the caption of the photos, I myself cannot even distinguish are they Berbers or Slavs. Although I am of East European descent myself, if I am shown a traditional costume, I cannot say for sure is it Berber or is it Slavic. They are identical, the costumes, and very often even the people who wear them. Despite the obvious connection between the Berbers and the people of Europe that even a small kid will notice, in the mainstream history they are viewed as absolutely independent. Credo Motwe is a very well known and respected person in all Africa. He is a shaman and religious leader. He still remembers the old history that the native people had before the parasitic forces came and substituted it with lies. In Africa is the same as in all continents. The locals were visited by angels, highly advanced beings who were tall, who taught them, educated them. The locals called them Muzungu. They contributed not only to making the locals more civilized, but they also contributed in a very practical manner to the local gene pool. That's why all over Africa, sometimes people with blue eyes or blonde hair get born. So, as in all other continents, both demoniac and angelic species left their genetic stamps. In Egypt, during pharaonic times, it wasn't different at all. It's obvious from the old depictions that all races lived along each other. Only in very modern times, people became racists brainwashed by the mass media. That's what they show us there. Politicians who talk about brotherhood, love and democracy while actively implementing programs and laws which create further inequalities in the societies. These laws and programs, they create gaps between the races. And this very modern phenomena of the racism is further nourished 
by shameless, fraudulent interpretations of history or straightforwardly fictional events which they are telling us. Like, for example, the situation with slavery. Things were radically different from what they are telling us. We will review slavery later on, now. Let's see what kind of people actually were buried in pharaonic times. King Tutankhamun's DNA shows that he was a Caucasian person. I wonder how many of the other pharaohs they've tested. Are any results published? But still uncomfortable facts leak out here and there now and then. Like, for example, in this cemetery, with some one million mummies. And very carefully, near the end of the articles, the mainstream newspapers mention that many of the mummies inside were of blonde or red-haired people. And, surprise, 213 centimeters tall. As far as I understand, they actually closed this cemetery excavation but some of the bodies were found some 30 meters below ground level. That is pretty darn deep for a burial. The burial is not that extremely old, as we can see from the stage of preservation of the bodies. And yet, how did this massive amount of 30 meters of soil pile up around them? And now we reach the topic of the mysterious land masses and sand masses in Egypt, a topic which doesn't get at all the attention it deserves because it could prove pivotal in revealing the true history of ancient Egypt, as we call it. Actually, some parts of the story are not at all ancient. And the main points here are that there is evidence showing that in pharaonic times, the region of Egypt was a tropical habitat, very pleasant for habitation. On the other hand, we have evidence that it turned into a desert within a flash. While at the same time, if you uh, open the official information on Sahara, you will find all that talk of the wind, and the rivers grinding rocks into sand for millions and billions of years. Again, the fool thinks things after fraud because the stories, they don't match at all. And on the other hand, the area around the Dead Sea, which can be seen also kind as a part of this desert, area. Over there we also have evidence that it was tropical, pleasant, in the relatively very very recent past and that it was burned, turned into a desert by weapons, as discussed in the previous video about the timelines of the earth. That made me remember a mainstream history documentary that I saw years ago on a mainstream TV channel where archaeologists were excavating villages that were swallowed up by the desert in Egypt. The picture that their excavations revealed was pretty sad. People were lying around there as if frozen in their daily activities. On the doorsteps of their homes, in the rooms outside, doing their daily activities. They were not buried. It really happened in a flash. In Egypt, they certainly didn't have the tradition of leaving the bodies of their relatives to lay around in their houses. They used to bury them, mummify them. And the fact that they were left like this means that the disasters struck so quickly that there weren't any survivors even to bury the dead. And as we delve further into uh, this, very interesting stuff starts surfacing. A very simple question. There is a whole lot of sand out there in Sahara, really lots of it. How did it end up over there, moreover, in a flash? We are being assured by the mainstream science that Sahara formed absolutely naturally, and they are telling us uh, that with such a certainty as if they were first hand witnesses when it was made. In reality, that idea is only a speculation. 
non-conformed hypothesis. On one hand, the origin of all sand, which looks like this smooth, of this color, is very suspicious and various scientists have been wondering and raising the question, is the sand in the desert as such of natural origin even, its uh, chemical composition doesn't match the type of stone which allegedly was ground by gradual erosion to turn into sand. Yes, there are some beaches with uh, usually black sand that really formed naturally, but these, the yellowish Sahara sands, they have been raising suspicion. Many geologists have said this sand really looks alien. And if one tries to discuss this point about uh, how Sahara appeared all of a sudden so recently, within a very short uh, geological period, um, the mainstream people will try to go around the subject with uh, vague things like the rivers must have carried it. Really, what kind of a river can carry this much sand? It will get clogged in no time. And from where did it carry it? Was there another Sahara somewhere else? And all of a sudden it packed and moved to the place of the current Sahara? But instead of uh, wasting time with their so-called hypothesis, if we just look at this photograph, what we see a uh, leveled surface of the earth and then really lots of sand just dumped there. And even the leveled surface on which the vehicle is driving, even that we are not sure if it has natural origins, because don't forget that the burials of the rather tall blonde people were found under 30 meters of earth. It is not normal to dig that much for a grave. It really looks like that the entire Egyptian civilization was buried with layers of soil, I don't know if it is clay as everywhere else or what, and then even sand on the top. After all, that seems to have been the standard procedure over the ages, for example in Turkey. This very interesting site of Nimrud, the structure is the main structure is covered with a pile of very uh, industrially looking gravel. Of course, the mainstream version is that primitive chaps dragged it in baskets on donkeys and mules. But in this penguin fairy tale, they conveniently skip to tell us the part of how did the lords of the mules and donkeys produce all this gravel. It's a very uniform size, it's very clean. You can't just collect this out there on the hills nearby. It has to be manufactured somehow. Also, Tiwatiwakan, and a couple of meters of clay. Massive amounts of clay would have been needed to cover the city. How did it land there? Another example of selectively burying historic sites under clay is the Great Pyramid of Cholula. Again, it turned out that the mainstream stories of how it was buried were a deliberate fraud, as shown in previous videos. It is not that uh, the dark Africans were just uh, sitting and waiting for the gods to culture them, they were also actively traveling all over the world. Now, the Olmecs from um, America were uh, very much international uh, mixture. Some of them are clearly African uh, and the Proofs for that start with these uh, huge stone heads 
some reaching three and a half meters. If the facial features are not enough, you can see the braids on the back of some of the heads, typical African braids. And also some old uh, skeletons of the Olmecs show clear connection with the African race and so are some similarities in their uh, writing systems. few more African faces from South and North America. first episode about the true history of America, we saw numerous depictions of African elephants found on the both American continents. The connection between the languages uh, uh, and inscriptions found uh, in various locations in both South and North America are again proof of uh, international relations. The African Olmecs had interesting um, friends, Chinese Olmecs, wearing the typical tattoo, face tattoo, uh, which is uh, one of the worldwide watermarks of the earlier waves of uh, survivors. Or, in this case, to be more precise, people who received their culture from the survivors. The parallels are countless now. Um, these are comparison between Chinese and Olmecs hieroglyphs. Now we have successfully managed to wipe out all Aztecs, which makes it very easy for the mainstream historians to tell us that they looked uh, like uh, native uh, people, like Native Americans, but the photos show otherwise. Not necessarily all Aztecs were of African looks, but certainly there were some amongst them, as shown on this pre-Columbian mural. These are more African artifacts found all over South and North America. Dogon cliff dwellings from Mali in Africa. And these are cliff dwellings from North America belonging to the Anastasi tribe. They look the same as the African. Other African uh, cliff dwellings called Telem. Africa also had its castles in a style which is typically European, at least for those who listen only to mainstream historic sources. 
This resembles the Pantheon in Rome, but is in the African city of Kilwa. An ancient traveler shares his first-hand witness account of the Tanzanian city of Kilwa. It belonged to the Swahili people. people. Ibn Batota says, that's the name of the traveler, he describes it as one of the most beautiful and well-constructed cities in the world. We have been led to believe that ancient Africans were jumping naked after bananas while only we in Europe were building uh, things like this, but this is in Mogadishu, Somalia. This is Mogadishu some hundred years ago when people were still enjoying the culture left by the survivors for them. But after the people of Somalia accepted the new history and the new paradigm and the new advanced civilization, this is what happened to them. We don't know how many millions or even billions are pumped into that region coming from funds for spreading democracy, keeping peace and other shameless lies. While I have heard from people who have been personally there that the situation with the so-called wild pirates has absolutely nothing to do with what we are told by the mass liars media. The so-called wild pirates, they enjoy very well functioning top modern communication system connected to satellites, of course, because there is no official ground uh, telecom connection or whatever you call it. So what to speak of anybody fighting them? They're being like given help to destabilize the region. Africa was well connected to the world with modern for its time poets and was minting its own coins. Coins that were used as far as Australia. At that time, the African people were respected as members of this worldwide culture and were traveling freely, not as slaves. This clearly African person lived on the shore of the Black Sea. As we saw in the previous episode, people from Africa wearing typical African skirts and accompanied by live giraffe were even depicted on the walls of an Indian temple. And on the other hand, Indian artifacts are found in Africa. Africa was not at all backwards. We've been lied to about it. And the reason for which they want us to believe that Africa was backwards is to convince the people of Africa to accept the fraudulent loans of the Western banks. And once they fall into that trap, the land is owned by the foreign big corporations. The people are driven away, either killed or starved. Local criminals are put in the respective governments, all financed by the funds for spreading democracy. And whoever has been left alive by the wars from the simple people, they can fend for themselves on the garbage piles. Now this piece of uh, beautiful blue geopolymer, or in other words, man-made stone, is from Sierra Leone. Our laboratories today cannot even figure out how did they color it, how did they make it. This site is in Ghana and very much resembles the European so-called Kurgan structures. Now look at this uh, African ruler or king, I don't know who is he, important person from Benin. He looks exactly like a s European, his uh, color and hat and outfit, everything. Well, in general, I must say, mainstream history is being quite unfair to the African continent. 
presenting them like uh, semi-dressed uh, people without any culture and living only in mud huts while um, the civilization that we have is uh, attributed only to the Europeans who supposedly came up with it. No, they did, they did not come up with it. We all inherited it from uh, the old civilizations. The colonialists did not bring any culture to Africa, they only destroyed as much as they could and whatever they couldn't tear down. For that they hired corrupt historians who wrote down a new history for them, according to which all the old buildings remaining from the culture of the survivors were relabeled as colonial. This doesn't look like a mud hut culture to me, it's from Sudan. The southern parts of Africa are home to millions, yes, quite few millions of circles. Some of them are simply earthworks while others are proper stone ruins, some of them quite impressive. Official archaeologists are not interested in them, they don't conduct any excavations on them, which is of course a sure sign that they will not fit in their expectations. And indeed, these circles are somewhat odd, many of them don't have doors or windows. Apparently, that means not much to official historians, and they continue referring to them as cattle compounds, built for all kinds of flying cattle, apparently. Now let's visit a site that may look to us like the capital of all stone circles of South Africa. It is called Great Zimbabwe and the official version of it, of its history is that nobody knows who built it and when and why and what was it. Well, when we hear in mainstream history that uh, it is a mystery or we don't know, usually that means um, you, they don't want you to know who built it. The style of construction used uh, in Great Zimbabwe is very very similar to the one of the Chachapoya people of Peru. This is Zimbabwe, the site is called Kami, and this is in Peru. Now the circles in Zimbabwe don't have much decoration, but this is the main one. This is in Zimbabwe, and now this is in Peru.
Now the bird symbol is considered the emblem of the great Zimbabwe site. It is definitely the main one over there. So what we have in the Chachapoya culture? Same, same bird and even the same zigzag pattern. Who were the Chachapoya people? They were red-haired and belonged to the Caucasian race. That is clear from their mummies that are found in Peru. Uh, we don't have skeletons from the people who built Great Zimbabwe, but we have an interesting medieval painting. Maybe this interesting African tribe from Zimbabwe had something to do with the architectural ideas of Great Zimbabwe, or maybe even building it. Why not? Of course, for mainstream history, this is unacceptable heresy and that's why they labeled it fanciful depiction. It's a typical approach that they do with all uh, ancient uh, maps and uh, sketches and drawings that don't fit their ideas. If you want to get a real feel of how was it to live in this type of uh, dwellings, you can visit the Italian village of Albero Bello, where we have that very same style of architecture, but much better preserved. There are a couple of mind-blowing earthworks in Africa, and here I'm gonna show you just one of them. It uh, goes across several countries, Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia and Angola. Not only the canals are dead straight, but they also continue in that way for hundreds of kilometers. Now this is just one single canal, it is half kilometer wide. This is just huge. Now the straight lines, dead straight, go on for over 400 kilometers. And I even haven't marked all of them, this continues here as well. These are also canals, so it is much much more. Yes, much much more hundreds of kilometers. Was this uh, made by primitive uh, people living in mud houses and carrying the earth in baskets? I personally cannot believe it because first of all the uh, amount of uh, time invested uh, if somebody starts calculating will reach a dead end to start with and uh, second of all if the work was uh, engineered and carried out by simple people on ground level, it would have followed, most likely, the natural curves of the terrain, which it doesn't. The scale of the full thing leaves the impression that it has been done from above. These are hills. I mean, did they uh, really dig by hand, to dig out the hills and remove them? No, I really don't believe this. The area covered by this particular system is uh, at least some uh, thousand kilometers in diameter. This is uh, huge, you can fit a couple of entire European countries in it. So what is the purpose of this enormous canal structure? Initially I thought it's actually irrigation, but later on as I noticed one detail, I think most likely it was something else, because... Do you see here how we have uh, another grid? crossing the better visible grid at an angle. It is not very well visible, but if you spend some time you will notice it. Basically, whatever gigantic, I don't know, bagger or whatever streams of sound was clearing all this, sometimes did it in that direction and they did it in this direction. 
So it looks like they were doing something with the area, clearing it up, leveling it, or so many other possibilities. They could have been uh, testing the earth below for something to mine, or this is part of some sort of mining, or maybe it was a weapon, or maybe they were simply archiving parts of the earth for the future civilizations to come. Or maybe because the earth is an artificial creation as such anyway, maybe these are uh, patterns left from the time when they were shaping the earth. Like they grew a couple of mountains made of stone and then exactly like an artist plays with the clay, maybe they, yeah, let's make a valley here. Or maybe an entirely different reason that we can't even imagine, because the full thing is beyond our scale of understanding. I mean, what kind of technology do we have nowadays that could make meters deep rows in the ground for hundreds of kilometers in a perfectly straight line? Since vast areas of Africa are scarcely inhabited or practically uninhabited, there are well-preserved lifelines in Africa, like this grid, for example. These lines are not uh, modern roads. This is one example. Uh, a line, actually, this is a dam and a line next to it some sort of farm and modern road here. This is the line. Um, it's definitely not another road because here is a usable road and it goes through terrain that uh, doesn't allow cars. You know, there is water, there is... Uh, it's uneven, so... This, uh, this is one of the many instances that proves that these lines are not some sort of modern roads. Now here a line can be compared to actual modern road. This is the modern road that is servicing these uh, power poles or whatever it is. So you can see the modern road is actually only one lane. You don't need more in the desert. It's uh, much smaller and it's uh, not straight. It follows the, the terrain. While the line is of completely different nature. Again, another example that shows that these are not roads. Again, here the lines are crossing terrain that is uh, not suitable for cars. And uh, also the cars would use this proper road. It has got a bridge. So these are definitely not some sort of modern uh, roads. Another example of a line crossing uh, terrain that is not suitable for a road. So these lines are not made recently as roads. This is the road, it has got a bridge and the cars can use it. This cannot be used by cars. Another proof that these lines are not modern roads, you see some sort of uh, unusual crossings and angles out there in the desert. I mean, what is the need of a crossing here? If, and it's not following the terrain. If it was a car track, it would be like this. You know, there would be no need of these angles. And this is all over the desert where there is uh, nobody anyway. Yet another case showing that these lines have nothing to do with modern roads is this. First of all, this line goes through mountains here. That also gives some hint that it, it uh, 
it is made by some sort of technology that uh, is not familiar to us probably from above because if it was done on the ground this would be you know difficult to crawl up like this and navigate in a straight line so not only it goes uh, through mountains but also it crosses the road here there is no crossing the cars are not using it and by the way all of the roads are probably most of the roads in uh, South Africa are probably uh, placed on the existing infrastructure on the top. Probably this was a broader line itself. Here are the, on the side, still the remains of that uh, broader line. Now this is interesting. The lines are here on very steep and not hospitable uh, terrain of uh, desert mountains. This is how the mountains look like. And still there are lines on the cliffs themselves. Here, here. And they continue. They continue. This is uh, this is impossible for a car, for a modern car, to have uh, done this, and yet uh, the lines continue, which is uh, another proof that they were made from above with some sort of technology. Not only these lines are obviously not roads, but also they are not fences for cattle, because um, there is a lot of uh, cattle industry in these semi-deserty parts of Africa. You, you don't put a cattle fence going off cliffs or crossing highways. Also for obvious reasons in this area the farmers don't use like uh, permanent heavy fences but they use this type of fences which do not mark the land as such what to speak of the very thick lines, which can be thicker than modern roads even. And even if somebody argues that, you see, the fence itself doesn't make a line, but there is always a road next to it, made by the farmer who is servicing the cattle. Well, anybody can open Google Earth himself, and all the dirt roads in the countryside, they're clearly visible. They look like a pair of tracks next to each other, and they do not look like the lifelines. Kind of dams. This, this must have been a very old dam. Definitely it's not a modern creation. It's so eroded. Now this is the interesting, this is huge, this here, I used the ruler, is um, over uh, almost 200 kilometers long. I noticed it on the map, it's just only one of such formations, here is another one, not so clear. So I thought, what are these kind of squares, this is huge, let's zoom in. And then I noticed those same, like, canal long lines. Do you see them on the right side? And then I noticed this brown spot, like burned. This is, of course, huge. And by the way, there were similar spots when I was looking at the system of canals which I showed you somewhat earlier in this video. 
So another hypothesis about these systems of canals is that they were actually kind of a cleanup after some nuclear or other very destructive war in the past. They needed to repair the earth to make it again suitable habitation for the future races. The brown burnt circle, it appears kind of on the left side of the screen now. This could be a nuclear crater or crater from some other weapon and the keepers of the time were simply cleaning the area and the long scars, the canals, are marks of the whatever tool or technique they were using. Who knows, this is just yet another hypothesis which is not proven yet. And this image illustrates how the bigger canal-like systems are connected with the relatively smaller lines. Not that we can understand much, but one thing is sure, they are connected very, very much. So they are interesting pieces of glass in the Sahara Desert. Similar glass sometimes has been the byproduct of modern nuclear tests. Is it possible that this glass is left over of some war that we don't know about? It's not that difficult to find out actually, because we have plenty of craters. And somebody who has got a dosimeter device and is curious enough, he can check what are the radiation levels at some of the craters. Many of them are conveniently and suspiciously located right next to historic cities. This is Ethiopia, Aksum. Of course, there could be some remains still of higher radiation levels if uh, the bombing was done fairly recently. But even the very abundance of such craters near cities of the recent history by itself raises questions. So, were people always attracted to craters when they were building their cities? Or is it more likely that the craters appeared because of the cities? In Siberia, people got curious enough. Many of them did do their homework, field work, and found indeed higher radiation levels at number of city craters, so to say. I don't know if somebody has done anything like this for the craters in other parts of the world. salt and sulfur lakes in Africa. Some of them could be natural formations, yet other could be tailing ponds, leftovers of the mining of the previous civilizations. Mm -hmm. 